Nearly 400 dead and over 7,000 injured in massive 7.3 magnitude earthquake on Iran-Iraq border. Committee on Public Accounts presents report to Parliament. Former President's Chief of Staff Garmin Sinarath and two others remanded. Kerosene oil mixed into petrol bowser. Racket exposed. Petrol addresses letter to Speaker to obtain affidavit for dual citizenship verification. Tempers flared in Parliament yet again. Bringing you the very latest from across the nation and around the world, this is your Primetime News Bulletin. A very good evening. I'm Shane Silva. And I'm Dasni Atada. Let's start off with a look at tonight's top story. At 21, at 2118 local time, a 7.3 magnitude earthquake struck the border region between Iraq and Iran, killing at over 400 people and nearly 6,500 are said to be injured. An Iranian aid agency said 70,000 people need shelter after the quake, one of the largest this year. The U.S. Geological Survey reports yesterday's powerful quake hit close to Hal Bajar, southeast of Suleymaniyah, a city in the semi-autonomous Kurdish region of northern Iraq. The quake struck in a relatively shallow depth of 23.2 kilometers and tremors were felt in Turkey, Israel and Kuwait. Iran sits across major fault lines and is prone to frequent earthquakes. At the location of this quake, the Arabia plate is moving towards the north with respect to Eurasia plate. The two plates converge along a northwest striking plate boundary in the general vicinity of this quake, driving the uplift of the Sargos Mountains in Iraq. Most of the victims are believed to be in the Iranian town of Sarbol Azab. Mosques in the city have been broadcasting prayers through loudspeakers. Iranian media said rescue teams deployed in the area amid fears the death toll will rise. According to local Kurdish media on the other side of the border, Suleimani officials declared an emergency to assess the aftermath of the quake. Sunday's quake is the deadliest to hit Iran since 2012. We now recall one of the worst quakes in history which triggered the deadliest tsunami that swept across Asia. The epicenter of the earthquake, 26th of December 2004 at 6.58 a.m. local time, struck off the west coast of Sumatra, Indonesia. The shock had a magnitude of 9.1 to 9.3 and occurred at a depth of 30 kilometers below the sea flow. It took two hours for the tsunami and 226,000 people died. On to another story that made the headlines tonight. Now, the People's Action for Free and Fair Elections, or PAFRAL, has requested Speaker Karuja Surya to verify the citizenship status of all parliamentarians. In a letter to Speaker Karuja Surya, PAFRAL Executive Director Rohan Hetiarachi has called on the Speaker to obtain an affidavit from each member of Parliament affirming that he or she has no status of citizenship in another country. PAFRAL notes that following the court ruling on Gita Kumar Singha, a large-scale social discussion and equally serious suspicions have emerged among the public about the citizenship of other members of Parliament. The letter notes that the control of immigration and immigration had revealed to PAFRAL that no other member member of the present parliament, excluding Geeta Kumara Singer, had dual citizenship certificates issued by the department. The letter concludes by calling on the speaker to obtain affidavits in order to dispel social suspicion and to protect the honour and dignity of all members of the parliament. The Committee on Public Accounts presented its report for the year 2015 to Parliament today. The report assesses the financial activities and performances of public institutions, provincial councils and local government authorities. Honourable Speaker, I hereby submit a third report of the Committee on Public Accounts at the first session of the 8th Parliament. This is the first time in the history of this Parliament that the Committee on Public Accounts, consisting of 25 members, including myself, is presenting reports to Parliament on all the institutions that should be summoned to the Committee. 31 reports have been submitted in Parliament chambers since 1978. These 31 reports covered 410 institutions. At present, the Committee on Public Accounts needs to summon 831 institutions each year. 
As we discussed previously, the Ministry of Finance has also focused its attention on the matter. The Honourable Minister and the Secretary has assured that they will take steps to look into these reports in the future. Therefore, I take this opportunity to congratulate you on this. UPFA parliamentarian Bandula Gunawadana raised questions in Parliament today regarding the underutilization of funds allocated through the budget. If you cannot utilize the 20% of the 792 million allocated through the budget proposals, then it goes to say that the entire cabinet is inefficient. Now, a separate committee of Manu Tittawala has been appointed to examine this budget. Who is Manu Tittawala? Is he a government servant? The people should know how this is happening. A person in the private sector is the chairman of the government's budget implementation unit. Who is Manu Tittawala? Is he the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Finance? Foreigners are appointed and then they run away after stealing. Then a bond tax is imposed. Honorable Speaker, the MP is misleading the House. We have allocated a sum of 780 billion for the year 2018. So we have to work to the capacity of the state mechanism. Otherwise, we will not be able to utilize these funds. There's a slight truth to what the MP is saying, though. If the state mechanism is not strengthened, we cannot utilize these allocations. The MP raised two clear questions. Do you require an explanation? I'm giving you the opportunity, but you are creating issues. You raised two questions and I said you did. So what do you want to say now? A complaint was made to the Speaker and a no-confidence motion was submitted for misleading Parliament. What's left is to inform the inter-parliamentary union. we now hear some of the views expressed on the third day of the debate on the second reading of the 2018 budget in parliament in 2012 and 2013, it was at 6.7. By 2016, the poverty index had reduced to 4.1. Honorable Speaker, when we received independence, we had a surplus of funds. But today, after several political parties have governed the country, we have amassed debt amounting to 7,000 billion. As a result of the war, our country lost 400 billion US dollars. US dollars. This was not caused by the war. Even prior to 1983, there was no major development in the country. Last year, the Prime Minister who sits next to you noted that 43% of the population makes less than $2 a day. Uwa, where there was no war, had more poverty than the North, where the war was raging. So who has caused the most harm to the people? Rajapaksa took loans and stole. You are also taking loans and stealing. There is wastage. While you are talking about a blue-green economy, the president has said that the blue rogues are hiding in the green minister's homes. So your government is not clean and pure. According to his analysis, the world is full of poverty. Not a single economy has solved this. It is against such a backdrop that Minister Mangala Samaravira has presented this budget. Even if the god Sakra rises from his throne, it is possible that we may not receive instant solutions to these problems. Poverty is a major issue in every country in the world. We faced 2017 amid many challenges, including floods and drought. In 2017, the loss incurred by the CEB amounts to 31 billion. The loss incurred by Sri Lankan is 6 billion. However, 33 of the 55 state enterprises made profits. We must mention that too. Through his blue-green budget, Minister Mangala Samarivira has made many financial allocations for the program to move towards a green era. 
There were criticisms regarding a telecommunications tax and an increase in prices. However, he has noted that the tax will not be imposed on consumers using telephone services. Many views were also expressed of the 20 cent tax on bank transactions. On that matter too, he has said very clearly that this will not affect the consumer. There are banks which are reaping massive profits. It is through this that the financial allocations are being made. I am saddened due to a single proposal. There is no way that I can agree with the concession given for beer. The statistics that have been given to the finance minister are completely false. The statistic that 49% consume illegal liquor is false. I have the data with me. The NATA organization is also carrying out research. In a few days, I will prepare and present the correct data. However, according to data and statistics we have received from the police, the excise department and the divisional secretariats, the consumption of illegal liquor has declined. We now cross over to Ramesh Irugal Bandara, who is in the newsroom for one of tonight's headline stories. Welcome to the News First Newsroom. Tonight we are going to be talking about this. Act number 43 of 2011, Revival of Underperforming Enterprises or Underutilized Assets. Through this act in 2011, 36 privately owned companies were taken over by the government. The people that oppose this bill are today in the government. Now, through the 2018 budget, Minister of Finance Mangal Samarwira suggested something that would do away with this Underutilized Assets Act. The debate is now continuing in the mainstream. The first shot was fired by SLFP Member of Parliament, Minister Mahinda Amaravira. Let's listen to what he had to say in Parliament today. It was headlined in the papers that the Sevenagala Sugar Company will be returned. I do not think we can agree on that. I inquired from the Minister of Finance. There are items you cannot cover up in budget proposals. If there are any issues, they should be resolved. If there are mistakes in the order papers, those should be corrected. But any state-owned company cannot be handed over to a private owner. If a state-owned entity is to be operated by a private company, the handing over process should be done in a transparent manner. That is our stance. As ministers of the SLFP, it is not possible for us to object to such a decision within the cabinet. Now that was the view of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. What does the United National Party have to say about this? State Minister of Finance Iran Vikramaratna spoke to News First about this. The act that was brought in by Mahinda Rajapaksa was completely wrong. It discourages investment. Will this act release all the entities taken over by the previous government? We will do it if we can. I do not know about that. We have asked the officers about the practical aspect of this report. Certain parts are covered by the law. There is no review with regard to that. No, no. That is there. Certain things are given to the Board of Investment if there are investors from the private sector. When things are done in a proper manner, certain people will try to interpret this in different ways. Here the policy frame is wrong. The policy is wrong. Now, State Minister Ran Vikramatna says that the policy is wrong. Now, among these 36 companies uh, that were taken over in 2011, there were two companies. One in particular, the Sevenagala Sugar Company, which was previously owned by current Minister Daya Gamage. We have with us tonight Farah Shaukat Ali, who wrote a brilliantly worded article in 2011 regarding the Sevenagala Sugar Factory and how it was initially given to Daya Gamage in 2002, if I'm correct. That's right. How did this uh, transfer took, took place for us? Well, the, they, they had a tender process, uh, but sadly the Technical Evaluation Committee uh, of five people consisted of three people who were uh, were politically connected uh, to the United National Party and uh, none of the members, uh, or, um, either the three or the other two, had any expertise in this industry okay. and certainly there were no members from the Ke Sugarcane Research Centre. And uh, at the, during the bidding process uh, there were several offers, one that was much higher uh, but they didn't have a bid bond and so they were knocked out and uh, the, uh, the award was made to Dar April Exports okay. uh, in conjunction with the foreign company which is owned by which is, uh, which is connected to Minister Daya Gamage uh, and um, uh, they, the, the final price uh, which he bid and which it was awarded to him at was 550 million rupees okay. now there was a problem with this uh, there, was, uh, there was some controversy because the government valuer 
had placed a valuation of 1.2 billion rupees uh, on the value of the Sevengala Sugar Company. Uh, this was based on the fixed assets uh, methodology of, uh, of calculating okay. the, the, the gain. Um, however, the TEC, they actually resorted to the services of a private bank and the valuation then came out at uh, just 481 million rupees. Now, if you look at the fact that it was finally awarded at 550 million, uh, this is a significant uh, loss to the state. However, on top of all that, during this, uh, uh, during this uh, controversy, it emerged that the assets of this uh, sugarcane uh, factory, the Sevenagala Sugar Company, was they had uh, fixed deposits of 307 million, another 150 million in, uh, in uh, equipment, mm -hmm. and also 125, around 120 million in receivables from their supplies and so on. So does that mean that uh, the Agamge profited out of this transfer? Well, put it this way, um, uh, Ramesh, they had, they had assets worth 577 million rupees, mm -hmm. right? And Easy. they paid? And they paid 550 million. Okay. Uh, um, on the face of it, they would have profited by, uh, they would have had an immediate gain of 27 million rupees. But if you consider the fact that the government valuer had valued this business at 1,200 million or 1 1.2 billion with a B, billion rupees, then the 550 million seems to be the deal of the century. So it's another transaction similar to the bond scam that we are... Yes, and I, I, I would aver that this transaction, because it happened so, uh, so far back in time, uh, it, uh, actually perhaps surpasses uh, the, the, the so-called bond gate scam. Right. Another company that was taken over through this particular act is Selinko Leisures. Now, three separate companies were put in place to develop Selinko Leisure, and these three companies had a separate board of directors. Now, among these board of directors, there were three people in particular who were there in all three companies. There were Gamini Senrat, Neil Bandara Hapuhinna, and Piyadasa Kudabalagi. Gamini Senrat, as you know, is the former chief of staff of President Mahindra Raj Paksa. Now, in order to develop Selinko Leisure, these people wanted money. And one of the projects that came under Selinko Leisure was the Hyatt Hotel in Kolpiti. They requested money for this, and there were three state institutions that came forward to provide funds for this project. They were the ETF, Litro Gas, and Sri Lanka Insurance. ETF and Litro Gas gave in 5 billion rupees each, while Sri Lanka Insurance gave in 8.5 billion rupees, a total investment of 18.5 billion rupees. Now, the ETF passed this money through the central bank under strict conditions. The condition, one of the conditions, was that the ETF money cannot be transferred or used for any other purpose than the construction of the hotel in Kolpiti. However, the three persons involved in this board of directors transferred 4 billion rupees of this money to another project, that is, the construction of a Hyatt Hotel in Hambantara. They did this without even before a board approval was given for this transfer as well. Now, after this transfer took place, the FCID launched investigations on the Public Property Act. As the investigations were going on, Garmin Serra came to court and said, filed a petition and asked to stop the arrest. The magistrates court recently said that they cannot do this and they allowed the investigations to go ahead. And eventually the FTID investigations led to warrants being issued against the three persons that I mentioned. Finally, Garmin Serra and the two other persons surrendered to court and then they were remanded until the 15th of this month. The lawyers appearing on behalf of Garmin Sanarat and the two other suspects said, give us any bail conditions and we will agree to them. However, the Attorney General's Department appearing on behalf of the FCID uh, rejected this and now they are in remand custody. Now, there seems to be a pattern here. Back during 2011 under the tenure of President Mahindra Raj Paksa, it seemed that he was favoring his brothers and his relatives. Currently, under the good governance government, it seems like ministers are favoring their friends. This is public money that the government is playing around with. News First will keep you up to date with regard to all these transactions. We will have more tomorrow as well.
A group of 31 people, including parliamentarian Prasanna Ranavira, Western Provincial Council member Upali Kodikara, who engaged in a protest in violation of a court order, were released on bail. Bail was granted to the group and they were produced before the Hambantur magistrate today. Each of the accused were released on short bail of 500,000 rupees each. The joint opposition carried out a protest last month against the handing over of the Matale International Airport to an Indian company. A group of nine people, including parliamentarian Namal Rajapaksa, were previously released on bail. A welcoming ceremony was held for the group at the Hambadura Tissa Junction today. <laughs> The case that was filed against former Economic Development Minister Basil Rajpaksa and the former director of the Diminagum Development Department, Kitsiru Ranamaka, was called before High Court Judge Gihan Kulatunga today. The case, which includes five charges against the two accused, was filed by the Attorney General's Department on the basis that during the last presidential election, funds of the department had been used for propaganda purposes for former President Mahindra Rajpaksa. The counsel appearing for the defence requested court to postpone the case. This is because an appeal was being heard in the Court of Appeal against the appointment of High Court Judge Gihan Kulatunga to hear the case. Objecting to the plea, the senior state counsel appearing for the Attorney General's Department stated that the appeal was a delaying tactic of the defence and that the case should proceed in the presence of High Court Judge Kulatunga. The High Court judge informed the parties that an order in this regard will be issued on the 15th of next month. Addressing a gathering in Galan Bindunavava today, former President Mahindra Rajpaksa lashed out at the current spate of crime in the country. The former president presided over an event to unveil a statue of Lord Buddha at the Galim Bindin River Ulpad Gama Viharia and to lay the foundation stone for a new shrine. When you look at society today and the issues we are facing, society is gripped by a surge in the crime rate. Unlike ever before, we are in an era where not just the number of thieves have increased, but in an era where entire families, including little children, are killed in one go. This is how low the country has fallen. We fought a 30 year long war. Many sacrificed their lives. Our soldiers sacrificed their own limbs and won back this country. I think it goes without saying that after all this has been done, there are conspiracies to take this country back to the old states. <laughs> Senior journalist Lasanta Vikramatunga was assassinated in Aptidia on the 8th of January 2009. While the death of Wasim Tajuddin, whose charred remains were found inside his car, was ruled an accident under the previous regime, it has now been ascertained as murder. <laughs> Roshan Chanaka was shot and killed by the police in Katanaika while protesting against moves to change the EPF structure. <laughs> the people who clamoured for clean water in Rathapaswala received bullets in response. Three youth were killed. Journalist Pragit Eknaligoda remains missing. Over the past two days, News First has unveiled key pieces of information highlighted in the report of the Committee of Inquiry on the 2012 Valikada prison incident. The report recounts in horrific detail the events on that day in November 2012, which led to the deaths of 27 inmates and several injuries. Who should be held accountable? Dekem mereka kerja itu mai, ini tu syarat kita nak sila garu kita. Beri dia ni, kemang langgar hiti, oh, ada kena gila, oh, billing ada kena gila, main ni bahan dekila ada lagi. Kau dah tahu? Ada lagi tu, madu ke karan si, rangga jiwa kita na, ini madu ke karan si ni lada hari. Hari, itu korang main kini apa? Hatta main istana ini matu ini, main main beri dia lat nat tam, angin sila pun lat nat tam. मैं गिनिया भी देमी में नुस्सा हकरा ने मैं आये विषय में वेदिती आगे नहीं मैं करा आदेन अत मोन अपराध करना लड़ी किए ने का पेना पेना सीरियन था पहले लियो मगर आप इधर clearly the media was told and the media reported the incident as a prison riot and that they had taken the firearms the only footage the media obtained was of the armed group on the roof given that the guns were not used we are led to believe that the media and the rulers of the country at the time have tried to build public opinion in the country around the fact that these people were armed criminals <laughs> Yes, it was to justify it. In the report, P.G. Madhavala, who is a firearms expert, and W.D.G.S. Kunatilaka have noted that the amount of force used by the state was akin to an attack on a terrorist camp. That is the extent of the force of firearms used by the state. It mentions here that it was like an attack on a terrorist camp. 
In the first place, they say that these people were drug smugglers and murderers facing serious charges. However, if you consider the report, you see that the individual known as Manjus Ray was the first person to be hunted down. Manjus Ray was the first to be identified. He was selected first, followed by Kapila and Marlon. These three were the first to be killed. Yes, they asked us too. We were in the office. They asked us where Nilame, who killed Kote Hamduro, was. They killed them and then a military officer came to us and said that the three of them were dead. When I came out, I felt that I must unveil this information. I remembered the faces of several men. Two monks were killed purportedly over a sword at the Kote Rajama Viharia. Several months later, the museum, which was in a high security zone, was broken into and about eight or nine ancient swords were stolen along with about 200 other artifacts. The chief suspect from among the two was Harshamani Kirti Manjushri, alias Manjushri Nilame. He was asked what had happened and why he did this. He had said he could not answer at the time, but that he would make a full confession during the trial. So a serious suspicion arises as to whether he was going to expose another person over the theft of the swords and artifacts. I wonder about the swords and whether he was killed before he could make his confession. Convening a media briefing in Colombo today, the National Chamber of Commerce commented on the 2018 national budget proposals. Uh, we are very happy to note that the encouragement given on the policies uh, decided by the government for improvement of the national economy. But we really wanted the policies and, and not merely, you know, a budget should not confine only to social benefits. But we see that in this budget there is a certain emphasis on the national policies that uh, which the government is embarking on. And we are happy that this kind of policies have been articulated um, and they are trying to implement it within the next course of the next year. But what we have observed in the recent past is, as National Chamber, the certain amount of policy inconsistency in the revenue stream uh, of the government uh, they are again the uh, expectation of the business community was to have a consistent mid-term policy on government revenue streams rather than short-term ad hoc revenue policies. There are a huge amount of proposals. Uh, uh, the, the, these proposals, some of the proposals are getting repeated over a period of time. Sometimes you see one window for uh, BOI and other, other kind of, uh, the kind of uh, the enabling environment that has been repeated maybe once or twice or maybe three times. But the most important thing is going to be how we are going to implement those. Since there are a huge amount of uh, proposals, uh, then there is, we need to have some amount of monitoring, we need to have some amount of scorecard coming through, we need to get uh, the, the progress open to the economy and uh, then we can also support. The United Nations Development Programme put out a media release this evening announcing that Norway was extending a partnership with UNDP Sri Lanka to support resettling communities. UNDP Sri Lanka country director John Sorsen and the ambassador of Norway to Sri Lanka signed an agreement for a one-year project with a value of one million US dollars. The project will support 550 families as direct beneficiaries in the Jaffna district with an emphasis of the Mylidi Harbour areas. The aim is to create sustainable living opportunities and by strengthening institutional capacity of the Telipale DS division of the Jaffna district. Making the illustrated headlines tonight, this is our resident cartoonist Asanga Lagdo Hetti. <laughs>
Is the budget 2018 progressive and is it aligned with the government's vision for 2025? Join Face the Nation tonight at 9.30 p.m. on TV1 for expert views and analysis. And that's a wrap of Primetime News for tonight. For the News for Steam, I'm Dasmiya Thalda. And I'm Shane Silva. Good night.